Good afternoon, once again. We start our last, as I, but as I said, not least uh, panel, panel F, which is devoted entirely to uh, film. Uh, the uh, title of the panel is Med Film, a Medium of History, Fabric of uh, Memory. We have uh, four speakers and uh, one commenta uh, commentator. Uh, so I think we should uh, start. So our first uh, speaker uh, is Anna Krzynicz-Lozica from Croatia. Uh, the title of her presentation is Jasenovac Concentration Camp, Camp on uh, Film. Uh, Anna uh, graduated with, uh, with uh, an MA in Art History and Comparative uh, Literature from Zagreb University at the Faculty of uh, the Humanities and Social Sciences in 2008, uh, where she is currently in her final year of doctoral studies in the Literature of Film Performing Arts and Culture program. Um, under the supervision of uh, Renata Jam Jambresic Kirin. Uh, as a part of her doctoral research, she spent uh, the mm, academic year 2014-2015 uh, at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris, uh, for which she, she obtained the French government scholarship. Since 2005, she has been working as a freelancer, curator, and art critic and from 2010 uh, until 2016 as a re research assistant at the Croatian Museum of Architecture of the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts in Zagreb. Her research focuses on the intersection between architecture, visual arts, cultural memory, ideology, and history writing in the post-Yugoslav uh, uh, space. Currently, Anna is writing a book on the Croatian sculpture, Vera Dait Kralil, and her works uh, in uh, uh, a public uh, space. Anna, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will talk about documentary films on Yosenovac concentration camp. Many films have been recorded about Yosenovac, mostly documentaries. Uh, in the period from 1946 to 2016, more than 10 films dedicated to Yosenovac camp have been recorded, and the number of films that are only partially referring to Yosenovac is even higher. I will compare how Yosenovac concentration camp is shown on film in different time periods, but by analyzing three films that approach this topic from quite a different positions, often conflicting and uh, mutually opposing. But firstly, I will just give you a brief context uh, of Yosenovac's camp. Um, between 1941 and 1945, it was a place of imprisonment, uh, forced labor, and executions. Camp was a part of the system of camps uh, set by the Croatian fascist Ustasha movement that proclaimed the independent state of Croatia, a Nazi puppet state. Modeled upon the Nazi laws, racial laws were introduced against uh, Serbs, Jews, and Roma in order to create ethnically clean territory. Um, in Yasenovac's concentration camp, uh, members of national and religious minorities, that is Serbs, Roma, and Jews, and as well as Croatians that opposed the regimes, uh, were imprisoned and killed. The camp was extremely brutal, and prisoners, that included um, men, women, and also children, uh, were killed using knives, uh, wooden mullets and axes, or died of thirst and starvation. The history of Yosenovac's memory was and still is heavily corrupted by political and ideological manipulations, and it was almost exclusively linked to the creation of collective identities, be it supranational socialist identity or national and religious identities. Film has had an important role in these different and contested constructions, reconstructions, and reappropriations of collective identities that intersect through Yasenovac as a symbolic topos. I will focus on the mechanisms of identity construction using films, 
So it's to emphasize the danger of interpreting a documentary film, film as the one that necessarily brings the truth. Instead, I suggest the necessity of interpreting film as a document of a certain time, ideology, and identity politics, but also as a place of struggle over the establishment of meaning and repossession of memories. In my analysis, I will draw on a corpus of theoretical approaches to memory that are emphasizing its performative aspect. In the broadest sense, I refer to Richard Schechner's performance studies where he elaborates that everything can be studied as performance as long as we are focusing not only on the object or phenomenon, uh, phenomenon itself, but on the relations and effect that it produces. More specifically, I also draw on Lide Kaplat and Anne Kismelik, who write about the performance aspect of cultural pr practices such as art, literature, and the media, emphasizing the processional and dynamic aspect of performing the past and the present. And I have to mention here also the Mike Ball's uh, elaboration on Memory Act that we had opportunity to hear in the plenary talk, and also see its very inspiring demonstration and exhibition downstairs. Within this theoretical framework, I regard film not only as a representation, but as a performance of memory which plays an active role in the struggles over meaning and identity negotiations um, in the public sphere. Um, the relations between the subject of narration, the perpetrator and the victim, are differently placed um, in each film and form a various constellation of subject positions among members of different ethnic, national, religious, class and political groups. The aim is to read the ideological layer of films by, by analyzing, uh, analyzing subject position as a key place that makes visible basic mechanisms of meaning production. So I'll now, because of the lack of time, make very short and partial analysis of three documentary films with the emphasis on different subject positions and identity constellations that are presented in each film. The corpus of films dealing with the topic of Yesenia is much broader, and, but I believe that these three films will nevertheless give you an impression of diversity of contested representational strategies. So this is the first one. Um, the documentary film Yesenia by Gustav Gavrin and Kosta Hlavetny was filmed in 1945, directly after the liberation of the village and the Yesenia camp. And it propagates the collective identity of a unified people that is not only a victim, but also an active agent seeking justice. Yasenovac in the film works as a metonymy of the fascist terror in a whole. A simple binary opposition is formed between people on the one hand and fascism on the other. The goal of identity politics present in the film is to construct a people as a unique and comprehensive category that includes different national, ethnic, religious and class belongings. Narrator points out that everyone found their common death in the Ustasha camp Yasenovac. Serbian peasants, Croatian workers and intellectuals, all social layers, artists, writers, students, workers, peasants, Jews, Roma, and others. The very suggestive commenting voice identifies itself with the, the people who died in the camp on the one hand, thus appropriating the voice of the victims, and with the people it is addressing on the other hand. By doing this, it equalizes uh, victims, the nar narrator who speaks in their name and transmits their message, and the spectators to whom the message is intended. Victims are interpreted in a way that could be used to form a cohesion between different nationalities, religions, and classes so that they can function as a single social and political entity, while those responsible for the crimes were referred to as the enemy who tried to divide the people. Thus, the victims of the Yasenovac camp become the metonymy of the entire people, and the Eustachos who manage the camp become metonymy of fascism. This process of universalizing victims and using them for the purpose of building of un unique un identity of the people will remain the characteristic of the socialist practices of remembrance. But there is a peculiar specificity in this film, and it concerns the fact that neither Yugoslavia, socialism, or communism are directly mentioned and the people are not referred to as the Yugoslav people. Instead, the discourse remains extremely general. Um, with the construction of our people as a subject of narration um, that reappropriates the voices, voices of victims, and, and at the same time that the notion of our people is directed towards the implicit viewers, the film has another important function, and that is to show evidence of crimes so that perpetrators could be punished. Uh, while the narrator specifies the horrors that took place in the camp, inserted clips and photographs of the demolished camp and ruins of Yesenovac village were displayed, as well as corpses and human remains, 
short testimonies of surviving camp detainees. The aim of such a series of explicit photographs of horror is to accentuate uh, the brutality of the enemy, to show the evidence of the crime and to call for justice. Narrator exclaims how the ruins and corpses are accusing and calling for revenge. At the very end of the film, we can see clips from uh, war crime trials where faces of convicted perpetrators are shown while the narrator calls for justice. And uh, the film ends uh, with a frame showing the column of people marching through the streets with banners seeking vengeance for Asenovat's victims. Um, so the next film, uh, the poetic documentary film Asenovat, uh, is directed by Bogdan Zizic and recorded in 1966. It is one of the most valuable film achievements on this subject and certainly aesthetically most prominent. Uh, this film is also one of the few films about Yasenovac which does not approach this topic from the point of affirmation, construction, or performance of collective identities. Uh, the film director um, records his arrival in Yasenovac by train at the opening of the monument and landscape design of the memorial site. The absence of the narrator is remarkable and the only narrative fragments belonging to the win uh, belong to the witnesses who make their statements at the foot of the fly uh, flower monument. Fragments are short, the sound is blending from one statement to another, and in the background of the speech we can hear humming of people gathered at the ceremony. Witnesses do not declare themselves by national or religious background or by ideological orientation. The first witness points out that the detainees were all, of all nationalities and that they came from all parts of Yugoslavia. Other witnesses refer to detainees very generally, mainly as people or prisoners, women, children. On the one hand, therefore, the detainees are presented in their universal human dimension, and on the other, exclusively individually through individual statements. Uh, polyphony derived from such mosaic uh, narrative perspective creates an impression of vividness, diversity of perspectives, and the predominance of personal memory over a dominant historical, political, or ideological narrative that is completely absent here. The detachment of the objective point of view is suggested by the intro introductory sequence showing the train that arrives um, to Asenovac. Some shots uh, show uh, the view from the train to the landscape through the crevices, cracks, or grills um, on the train, narrowing the field of vision as suggesting the prisoner's subjective point of view while they were transporting by train to the Asenovac camp. A characteristic of Zizic's film is that it combines symbolic representation mode with classical documentary form. And I wanted to show it, um, but um, unfortunately, it the, the, well, the wireless doesn't work, so I'll just have to des describe it. Um, so um, the film begins with the beating sound of the human heart in the dark and ends with a white horse in a trot. The symbolism of light and darkness as a theme is performed through the film with visual contracts, cr contrasts within the same frame or uh, within a rhythmically distributed sequence of scenes. Sound also plays an important role in the creation of the meaning in the film. Instead of a voice that explains the events and tells the story from the beginning to the end of the film, there are various sounds like heartbeats, weeping and screaming of a mourning mother, birds twinkling, people humming, clump of horses, train sound, the sizzling of crickets or church bells ringing, rhythmically interrupted by moments of silence. This sound suggests that the meaning creation goes beyond discourse and beyond the identity processes that requ require verbalization and uh, narrative cohesion. The film avoids showing the victims within any fixed uh, identi oops, sorry, identity position, except from basic identity of human being that is outside of all the discursive and representative frames. By repeating the sound of heartbeat and scream at the different places in the film, Humanity is represented in its universal and ultimate ex existential sense of the bare life, uh, beyond all its national, religious, or political identities. Sounds in the film uh, and the repetition of dark takes are suggesting another layer of meaning in the film, and that is questioning, questioning on the, of the possibilities and impossibilities of representation and narration as such. Um, okay, and this is the third example. Um, uh, so, while the early post-war film about Yasenovac, so this first one, um, established very simple identitary opposition between the people and the enemy of the people, in this documentary film, made by Lorden Zafranovic, 
Blood and Ashes of Yesenovac, uh, filmed in 1983, um, the identity constellations are much more complex. Um, one interviewed witness explicitly declares himself both a Croat and a Catholic, the other as a communist, and the third emphasizes that detainees were of all nationalities from all cities and all places of Yugoslavia. The voice of the narrator describes perpetrators in a less passionate and more precise way than in this first Gavrin and Hlavetni's film, and they are only mentioned by their names. The identitary construction in the film closes with the release of the audio recordings of uh, Yugoslav President Tito's speech from 1952. The record of Tito's voice is released only in audio format, uh, as the sound that covers the collage of the shots and photos from the World War II and the Senovac Memorial site. In the speech, it is stated that crimes should not be seen in the national context, but as crimes of man against man. So Tito emphasized in this speech the role of communists in opposing national hatred and stresses that guilt for crimes in Yosemite should not be sought in a single nation, but in those who were then in power, and he calls them traitors of the people. The speech incorporates the time jumps that connect the past, that is the war, the present, the moment of speaking, and the future by emphasizing the fraternity and unity of all peoples as the main value of socialist revolution that needs to be preserved in order to avoid the repetition of such catastrophes in the future. Crimes in Asenovac are interpreted as a sacrifice that was necessary to build a socialist society and as a token of a more beautiful and happier future that everyone has to build together. Fragmented and extracted from the original context, Tito's speech was used in the film to stabilize the subjective positions related to the narrative about Yesenovac's camp. Since, since the film ends with his words, we could say that Tito is in fact an implicit author that includes all particular positions or, uh, of the previous narrator and witnesses, and thus functions as a main subject position or a sort of omniscient point of view from which the story of the camp is mediated. This is also confirmed by the visual, visual structure of the film that repeats the temporal constellation of the relationship between the past, the present, and the future from Tito's speech. The film begins uh, with a sequence uh, belonging to the film present, which shows the ceremony at the foot of the flower monument, so it's the same ceremony we saw in the previous film, with the music on, of the orchestra playing in the front of numerous audience and the scene of children coming out playfully from the Memorial Museum alongside with shots of horses playing. This idyllic landscape of the Asenovac memorial area, um, covered by the song of birds, is suddenly cross-fading into flashback of landscape of horror accompanied with the sound of gun gunfire. Um, the film returns to the past in the World War II and immediately after it, composed as a bricolage of various photographs and clips from the time, with interruption showing witnesses telling their memories in the present. Only with the closing words of Tito's speech, the camera returns to the film's present, with a sequence showing again commemoration at the Yosenovac Memorial site. Uh, the scene dominated by the bright red flag wavering on the wind whilst being car carried by a column of people clearly symbolizes how the film's present belongs to the socialist society and how the transmission of memory on the Yosenovac camp is placed in the context of producing a new socialist man. Masses of people around the monument, as well as the children playing from the beginning of the film, embody ideal viewers or recipients as a projection of the film's structure to whom the performative is intended on building a new socialist society without international hatred. The last frame from the low camera angle shows a flower monument against the background of the sky around which release doves are flying. Along with the multiple symbolism of peace, freedom, and the rise of the souls of the seas to the sky, etc., this take also suggests the orientation towards the future, repeating the teleological orientation of Tito's speech on Yosenovac's victims as a token of a bright future and of the building of a socialist man. So uh, this is the film that I'll unfortunately have to skip because the de analysis would take me another 20 minutes, but I'll just say that this is a recent, very problematic film, actually, that was very controversial. Uh, it was uh, made by Holocaust denier, who tried to prove with, the, with this film that concentration camp was just, uh, Yesenovac was just, uh, well, harmless labor camp. And for proving this, the um, film uses footages, original footages that were uh, filmed in the Yesenovac. Um, and they were made by Ustasha Propaganda, like a professional photographs, and they were staged. So they were really, um, the, 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 uh, the, the 
the purpose of these photographs was to really uh, make false impression of the uh, character of the concentration camp. But it is used in this recent film as um, uh, archiving and as an argument that proves that it was really just a labor camp. But I'll just skip it. Um, no, 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 I'm not finished yet, sorry. <laughs> uh, just a small conclusion <laughs> and then I'm... And uh, so the goal of this brief um, overview is to summarize only one aspect of these films, the one that relates to the identification mechanisms used in them, in order to draw attention to the d diversity of the film approaches to the topic of Yesenovats. Gabrins and Hlavetny's film establishes the post-war cohesion of the unified people and calls for justice. Zizic's existentialist film uses trauma for reduction of collective identities to their basic human existence while Zafranovic's film perpetuates the discourse about building a new socialist society. So my aim is to show how, apart from more or less accurately referring to the past events, documentary films have um, an active role in the present, and the present is not just a moment of film production, but a moment of its reception. Their role is not only to document and present more or less objective the existing corpus of knowledge about the Senovac's camp, but also to deconstruct or construct certain subject positions. Although these positions are the product of the film media, they are directed towards the audience as an encouragement for different identification processes. This is the moment in which the film ceases to be only a representative medium and becomes a medium of performance that can play a role in producing a certain social space. So to conclude, I would say that the problem of different identity politics in the context of memory performance is at the same time an ideological and social phenomenon as well as an intrinsic media phenomenon relating to the film communication, more precisely to the relationship between film and its viewer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the first uh, uh, presentation. And now let me invite our <clears throat> next speaker, Agnieszka uh, Kiziewicz who is a PhD candidate at the Jagiellonian University in uh, Institute of Audiovisual Arts. Her research interests revolve around the Japanese film and other visual arts performed by the artists from the country of Cherry Blossoms. Until, she now, uh, until now, she's been writing about Shinto religion in Japanese uh, cinematography and the Japanese independent cyberpunk cinema and also about, uh, in general, uh, Japanese culture. Currently, she's uh, researching on the avant-garde and experimental films, focusing on the achievements of the young film uh, makers. Uh, the title of today's uh, presentation is uh, Bye Bye Innocence, War and Children Traumatic Memories in Japanese Film. Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you for introduction. So uh, before I start, I need to give a brief description and history of my research because uh, probably you wonder why researching on Japanese avant-garde cinema, why, why uh, something about uh, classical films, because today I will talk a little about classical films. So uh, for me, it started uh, from Terayama's movie in famous uh, tomato, uh, tom tomato uh, ketchup uh, emperor. And um, I will talk about this film later, but this film started a process that uh, I started thinking about this uh, children's traumatic memories in Japanese films, and not only in classics that I will show you, but also in the films that are not obviously about, uh, about the war, and, but they are about trauma, so uh, it's more connected with post-war uh, post things. But uh, let's start from uh, the brief introduction, because uh, talking about children in Japanese culture, so this is completely diff different culture from the European one that we are uh, deep into. So and I wanted to show you something about education in Japan and its influence on depictions of memory in films. So I need to uh, tell you about uh, Shitsuke. So uh, Shitsuke is a Japanese child rearing process. So and uh, literally it means the act of putting into the body of a child the arts of living and good manners to create one grown-up person. So this uh, 
uh, process as a whole is very important because it is connected with traditional ideology and family. And this is the whole process that shouldn't be stopped at any moment. So this is important to start this process, to, uh, this is important for this process to be started by the family and uh, to be continued till uh, the school education. So and, uh, also I need to mention on the other hand, the popular Japanese saying states, and the saying is, until seven amongst the gaps. So it means that before the school education, the child is uh, some special being, not only a human being, but some special being having special status. So uh, when we think about these memories and films about memories, so I will tell you later that those films uh, depict uh, the stop of the process. So this is the problem. And uh, so, Mm, I need also to mention that uh, nowadays at the age between six and seven, a child in Japan starts compulsory education. So uh, the child then begins uh, its social life and leaves the period of a symbolic divine protection. So, and from this part, uh, we go to the objectives of this presentation. Um, so I will tell you about uh, the implications of the transitions between those two orders, divine and secular and this stop that I mentioned. And then we can jump into uh, those two categories of bad memories in film, because if we stop the process, what uh, Japanese films about children uh, show, so if we, uh, if we stop this process, uh, we encounter the problem of bad memories of a child. So, and those uh, bad memories of a child are depicted in Japanese films uh, in two ways. So, um, the first way, the, in two cate categories, we can say also. So, the first way is that um, the bad memories are the results of the external events that disturb the natural flow of time. And, for example, warfare, war, uh, or the presence of sudden death in the close environment of a young character. So, today I will focus on this first category, talking about uh, war, uh, films about war and bad memories. But also, in Japanese cinema, we can find the pictures related to the affairs happening at school and the toxic relations between the members of a class, factions, or other school-related groups. So, it will be the second category of films about bad memories uh, of children. So later on, I will mention some of also some of this, uh, those films to uh, to compare. So, uh, but uh, we need to uh, we need to talk also about uh, the films before the war because not uh, not always in Japanese cin cinematography uh, all the films were about bad memories and war. Mm, before the war, there was a genre, um, and uh, it was called Jido Ega. Jido Ega, it means a juvenile film, and um, as Keiko MacDonald, uh, mm, is a researcher and, uh, who focuses on Japanese uh, film, so as she observes, uh, in 1930s, um, there was uh, in Japanese cinematography and the Japanese film market, uh, it was the search for forms of innocence that were uh, that the filmmakers were uh, able to sh uh, to sell. So it was very important to show those uh, juvenile films, and people wanted to um, to watch them. And uh, this golden age of films about children, uh, lasting from um, 1937 to 1941. And so here we uh, should, for example, mention uh, the film by Hiroshi Shimizu, um, who devoted a great part of his filmography to uh, portraying uh, those bucolic land of childhood times. And for example, as you can observe here, Children in the Wind, uh, so Kazan Naka no Komodo Tachi uh, from 1937. And that showed, uh, and this film is uh, very, uh, very well known. So this film uh, and also another film, Four Seasons of Children, uh, presented the stories of two brothers, uh, Zenta and Se Senpei. And what is important in my analysis is that um, 
of course, there were some events in the lives of, the, of those two boys, but after the events, uh, they were able, still able, to enjoy pleasures of life. Uh, so the, the protagonist quickly forgotten uh, about the temporary misfortunes, uh, and the mentioned pictures provided happy endings. So this is important, and uh, also leaving no place, uh, no space for despair uh, and some unpleasant memories. So, uh, in uh, those Jido Ega films, there were no space for unpleasant memories of the protagonists, and this is important. And also, uh, so we have no mechanism of creati uh, creating bad memories, and also this is important that, th that those films were the comedies. Yep, so we uh, don't have this mechanism, and also, um, uh, also, those films, uh, those those narratives about childhood in the bosom of nature, also appeared after uh, 1990s. Uh, for example, here we have Hoichi Higashi's film *Village of Dreams*, and I think it was uh, pretty well known uh, in Europe also because we could also in Poland observe this film uh, in the cinemas. But uh, it doesn't mean, uh, of course, that there there was a war. So uh, it. Uh, doesn't mean that after the war there were no uh, pictures about children living uh, in the nature and so on, but uh, those pictures uh, weren't uh, the whole genre, so sometimes we can encounter them. Uh, but what happened after the traumatic event? So let's uh, let's go into the uh, the clue of this presentation. So the main topic of this presentation. So. Um, the traumatic events of the World War II changed the perception of a child in Japanese cinema, of course, and um, this uh, child figure in Japanese post-war cinema came to represent a very important discourse, uh, a discourse of the lost innocence. And this innocence was taken by the history. So this is important. Uh, not, uh, it wasn't taken by the people. Uh, the concept is, is uh, that it was taken by the history itself, by, by the events. And uh, also, uh, the important fact uh, depicted in the films is that the traumatic memories might postpone or even constrain children's progress to adulthood. So uh, they cannot, uh, they can, the children cannot escape bad memories. They cannot go farther. So and uh, here we go to the, to the part uh, part of uh, conclusion that uh, the, ch the this discourse and the child represents uh, the loss of innocence and. Uh, here, let's go to uh, some of the examples. Uh, so, for example, uh, we should focus on 24 Eyes, uh, Nijushi no Hitomi by uh, Keisuke Kinoshita. And uh, this film uh, is the adaptation of Sakai's boy's novel from 1952. And, uh, the plot uh, follows the uh, pre- and post-war career of a teacher, Hisako Oishi, and the fate of her students. So, and even though this uh, brilliant uh, education tries to teach her pupils universal virtues and raise self-conscious uh, citizens, uh, even though so the, uh, the trauma will chase them long after the tragic events. So, uh, no matter um, what she uh, what she did so they cannot escape the memories. And so the figure of a teacher reuniting uh, with her alumni after the war also appears in Kaneto Shindo's uh, picture. So Kaneto Shindo uh, may be uh, better known from Onibaba uh, films, so uh, the devil woman. Uh, I think it's the translation. And uh, so, and but this picture of a uh, teacher also appears in Children of Hiroshima Genbaku no Ko from 1952. And this film is very important because it uh, is based on the collected memories of the primary school students, so real memories of real students. And later, those memories were composed into the narrative scenario. And the film emphasizes the fact that it is important possible still uh, to forget about the trauma. So, and also the children who survived are, are reminded of the, uh, of the dead members of their families, not only by obvious signs of their, um, of the newly uh, 
build a uh, environment. For example, they observe new houses and they remember about uh, the dead neighbors. But also, uh, the families cultivate the memories of bad uh, of dead members uh, of the families. So the children are uh, deep into those bad memories and they cannot escape because everybody uh, reminds them about it. Um, so. Uh, looking at, at those two pictures, it can be observed that the post-war cinema provides uh, the picture of the young people caught in the trap of requiring recollections of the past, what generates additional trauma and deprives them of the innocence. So, on the other hand, uh, as a signif uh, significant example of the film that il uh, illustrates the process of fighting with the trauma, uh, we, um, we should mention uh, the animation, uh, the animation uh, Grave of the Fireflies, Hotaru no Haka, and uh, directed by Isao Takahata and Studio Ghibli. So uh, in uh, this Studio Ghibli's picture, uh, we encounter young Seta, and this is the boy, uh, who tries to survive the constant bombings, hunger and terror, while taking care of his little sh uh, sister Setsuko. And what is significant and what brings us uh, to, to tears uh, is that uh, the protagonist does uh, his best to pretend the normal life. So this is uh, this is a very moving part because he pretends the real life in front of a, a girl to save her from the trauma and bad memories. I'm not going to reveal if he... Um, uh, what, what is uh, at the end of this movie, but this is important that he tries to fight uh, with the trauma. But... Um, also, uh, talking about trauma and traumatic memories and bad memories uh, in Japanese cinema, we need to mention something. Uh, we need to mention children's utopia in the films that um, maybe uh, we. Um, it is tricky to connect them to uh, to war of on the first glance because uh, I will I will tell you later why. And but the children's utopia in Japanese films. Uh, based on the motives of creating their own rules of existence by the child protagonists in Japanese post-war films. And so we here we observe the revolutionary groups of uh, white youths destroying the social order at school or other spaces. So And because they come out against the laws stated by adults, they observe that the laws stated by adults was something ro uh, wrong that uh, led to the war. So they try to create something, but they try to create something knowing only this law that led to the war, so uh, nothing good can happen. And uh, so uh, if they try to replace uh, the, this process of replacing the adults' rules, we can observe, for example, in Suicide Club, Jisatsu Sakuru um, by Sion Sono. And um, so, um, for example, uh, of, of course, this film isn't about war, but here we uh, can observe this post-war utopia that influenced Japanese cinema and also the discourse about uh, about children. So here, uh, the observer uh, can um, can observe this uh, this um, students destroying the social order and creating new law. New law uh, being a game, so a game of killing each uh, each other together. So jumping. Um, in front of the train. And so this uh, utopia also we observe in this film that I started uh, talking about at the beginning. So, and in famous Emperor Tomato Ketchup, so Tomato Ketchup Ukote from 1971 by Shuji Terayama. This is, I'm not going to describe this film uh, thoroughly because uh, here I should mention the whole history of Japanese avant garde and who was Terayama and his theater. But uh, let's focus on this film. And this film uh, shows the alienation of the young generation and uh, their feelings of being misunderstood by others. And then uh, e, uh, this, this results in creating the shocking way of the manifestation of rejection of the, uh, of the order uh, because uh, this uh, avant-garde visual college uh, showed that cruelty of the children 
hunting adults uh, because they are hunting adults. They try to kill them. They try to hominate them, and uh, they hunt uh, them because they try out to they try to wipe out all memories. So uh, they they believe that if they wipe out the adults, so they wipe out the memories about war and trauma, and uh, so. Of course, the children are not able to replace the adults' rules as their initial plans lack the experience necessary to create a new world on the ruins of, of what they destroyed and what war destroyed in their minds. So uh, going to the conclusion, uh, so the tragedy of adolescents presented in Japanese cinema revolves around the problem of erasing the recollections of the trauma and erasing the bad memories. So uh, on the one hand, we have somebody uh, who can help children, but uh, of course, uh, different things uh, happen in different uh, movies, but also uh, we have the children trying to do something uh, by uh, by themselves. So, but uh, we should focus on the um, on the important aspect that that the, Jap uh, the Japanese filmmakers emphasize the influence of the external factors of the mechanism of creating bad memories. So, those external factors are very important, and this external factor is history. And so the traumatic events of the World War II for the Japanese nation resulted uh, in new ways of presenting children's characters. And this analysis uh, that I presented here, of course, this is a uh, very brief analysis and I should give you more and more examples and um, and it, uh, it could be longer, but I think that I, um, I showed you the point that the bad memories and the ways the bad memories are depicted in Japanese cinema. So thank you. Thank you very much. And let's invite our next speaker, Bea Margitazi. Uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department on Film Studies at uh, Edvos Lorand University in, in Budapest. Her research interests include in, uh, interferences between film and visual culture, contemporary film, analog, analog digital nostalgia, sensual aspects of trauma and memory. This is kind of a uh, catalog of um, uh, interesting uh, topics. And post-communist Hungarian cinema. She is also the author of the book uh, As Ark Mozia, it's Hungarian, so I switched to English, The Cinema of the Face, Close Up and Film Style, uh, which was, uh, was uh, published in 2008. And she is also co editor of the Reader uh, Visual uh, Communication. Uh, uh, this is a journal, right? No, it's a, an anthology. Ah, it's an anthology um, uh, titled Visual. Uh, communication which came out uh, came out in 2010. Her studies, critical essays and translations were published in different Hungarian and English language anthologies, periodicals and uh, magazine. Uh, Bea is uh, also the co-founder and editor of Transylvanian Film Portal uh, and you have uh, the link in uh, your uh, uh, conference uh, guides. Uh, the title of Bea's uh, presentation is Embodying Sense Memory, Animating the Analog Photographic as Evidence of Traumatic Experience in East European Post Cinema. Uh, and we have three titles, Son of Saul, Regina and Warsaw Uprising. Yeah. Bea, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, thank you for introduction and thank you for accepting my proposal to this conference. I'm honored to be here. What are we talk? Uh, I will talk about today, it's uh, uh, mainly concerned to a very well-known um, movie and to other not so well-known, I mean internationally not so well-known um, movies, which I will connect through uh, how they engage with archive material. Um, Laszlo Nemesis, Son of Saul, was definitely an outstanding, but not a solitary example of uh, sensual evocations of individual and collective experiences of second world trauma in recent East European cinema. Janko Massa's Polish war documentary, War Surprising, and Diana Gross' Hungarian poetic documentary, 
Regina, have in common with Nemesis feature film that they are all based on unique visual and written war documents created by victims of German atrocities. Though living and dying in the shadow of Second World War constitutes definitely an indirect, mediated experience for the generation of Gro, Kamasa, and Nemesh, as they are in their 30s and 40s, their movies transmit a central experience based on the incomplete raw archive sources they, they use. The Zonda Commando Diaries, known as the Scrolls of Auschwitz, and photographs taken in August 1944 in the case of Son of Soul, and two surviving pictures of Regina Jonas, the world's first woman rabbi, representing the single initial visual source in the creation of Regina, and the archive news footage filmed during uh, 1944 as seen in War Surprising. The growing temporal distance do not seem to temper the transnational academic and cinematic interest in Holocaust legacy and Second World War events. Movies dealing with the cultural and ethical implications of this traumatic heritage appear in a quickly transforming post-millennial political, social, and media landscape, and thus exceed the historical perspective of their topic in multiple ways. In an age when war trauma, genocidal atrocities, racism, and anti-Semitism are still globally present and alive, and when cinema losing its dominant position becomes a part of a wide new media landscape, the question proposed by Thomas Elsasser's postmodernism as a morning work, namely, why this or that film now, leads to the examination of contemporary embeddedness of these films. Inspired by Freud's latency hypothesis, problematizing the temporal delay between the traumatic event and its processing, SS proposition points to the interconnectedness of past traumas and present status quo that are together responsible for why and what exactly gains actuality in a given moment. Um, to get closer to the three movies, uh, let me introduce shortly two inherent contexts they uh, activate. First is the tradition of Holocaust representation in cinema, and second, the recent transformations in Holocaust memory culture. Alexander Kabrinsky and Gerd Beyer in their edited volume on Holocaust cinema in 21st century point to the fact that critical discourses and questioning the possibility and legitimacy of representing Holocaust, barred by Theodor Adorno's, Ali Wiesel's, and Claude Lenzmann's short, uh, strong disagreements, lately gave place to an interest in the different modes of representation, the formal and ethical parameters particularly the different strategies and techniques by which traumatic memories can be kept alive. As a consequence of this, Kabrinsky and Bayer register an expressed consciousness about the limits of cinematic representation, a self-reflexivity on their own mediatedness, and the growing role of visual archive, especially the insertion of photographs into films, a gesture signaling explicitly the mediated nature of commemoration. On the other hand, um, recent movies are also affected by a new temporal phase of Holocaust remembrance. As all live communicative links gradually fade out, the post witness era brings new frames of memory transmission. Aleida Asman identifies three of these, near identification mode characteristic for children of survivors, and the ethical mode, appearing typically at the second generation of Germans, we face the appearance of empathy mode, which offers an effective involvement open for everybody without any special personal, familiar, or national language. This new frame of memory raises sensibility and solidarity for the suffering, helping the observer to imagine her or himself in the same pain, but also being able to keep the difference between the self and the other. As she suggests, all that have been embodied by survivors as primary witnesses from now on, I quote, have to be recreated and re-experienced in a new, in a, medi in a mediated form, in a new media setting. Um, I find that the apparent contradiction between media reflexivity and the call for an effective involvement is bridged in this movies in their special handling of photographic documents as memory objects, the way they address the empathy of the spectators by clinging to the sense memory encoded in these visual evidences. I see these three movies as performing a cinematic memory work, which in Anette Kuhn's definition is, I quote, an active practice of remembering that takes an inquiring attitude towards the past and the activity of its reconstruction through memory. Memory work undercuts assumptions about the transparency 
uh, or the authenticity of what is remembered, taking it not as truth, but as evidence of a particular sort, material for interpretation, to be interrogated, mine for its meanings and its possibilities. So starting from this, the three movies um, share both very similar and very different formal, stylistic, generic, and thematic qualities. They were produced independently from each other, but the time and the place of the three stories finally intertwine in Poland in the darkest shadow of the Holocaust. Regina's story begins in Berlin in 1902 and ends in the autumn of 1944 in Auschwitz concentration camp, same place and time when um, Zonderkommando uprising, Son of Saul's uh, plot, took place. The third movie story is about an uprising as well, organized in the same month by Warsawian citizens in order to liberate the town from German occupation. The movies take use of several written and visual historical documents, and all the events evoked have ended with the violent death of the characters seen on the archival images. And photographs have a privileged status in this post-memory context, as through their Bartian having been their quality, they embody a material connection, an umbilical cord between the past and present in the most classic Persian indexical sense. And more than just showing and representing, photographs are able to communicate emotional and corporeal experiences, transmitting bodily sensations that otherwise would not be representable by language. Based on memories of Holocaust survivor, poet Charlotte Delbo, art historian Jill Bennett called this aspect a deep and effective sense memory, a quality that, I quote, involves not so much speaking of, but speaking out of a particular memory or experience. It does not just present the horrific scene, the graphic spectacle of violence, but the physical imprint of it, a compromised and compromising position to see from." Unquote. Um, Son of Saul um, script was based on the scrolls of Auschwitz, the secretly wrote and buried diaries of some Zondokomando members, a special group of Jewish prisoners forced to participate in the extermination process in the crematorium. Son of Saul's um, representational strategy was evidently and directly inspired by the four secretly taken blurs on uh, well known Zondokomando photographs, recognized by historians as Dan Stone puts it, unquestionably the most important visual record that survived Holocaust. Beside dramatizing the photo-taking action, Laszlo Nemes adopts the visual style, namely the sense memory inscribed in these photographs, and builds its whole audiovisual atmosphere on this perspective of looking but not seeing from the witness's point of view, transmitting the tension of fear and violence, the attack on the senses carried in and by them. Although the pictures taken in the diegetic situation seem not to be similar with the original ones and are totally blurred by smoke in the respective scene, their specific incidental focalization and compositional aspects are incorporated in the form of some emblematic framings in different scenes and added to them reactions, shots of, of Saul's face, turning the viewer's attention towards the other side, showing the photographer's point of view and a form of gesture of suturing together the archive photographic in the actual cinematographic apparatuses. I would just show one example, um, two examples, but there are many in the film. Uh, the point of views of the uh, original uh, photographs, uh, um, photograph number two, uh, 118 and 281, indicate a hidden position in the darkness of a gas chamber and the look directed outside through the visible door frame applied in two important scenes in the movie. The inspection of the miraculously surviving Jewish boy, the supposed son of Saul, appears in a very similar composition and framing. Saul is hiding in the background and watching from the distance the SS doctor who is suffocating the still breathing body. A seeing in this moment uh, turns into watching, although Saul usually tries not to watch what is going on around him. Later on, on the final scenes, uh, repeat this inner framing and is again associated with death. After their escape, the prisoners take rest in a shelter in the middle of the woods, and so suddenly observes a young Polish boy stepping in the doorway. Uh, he reacts with a smile, the first and the last smile uh, we see on his face before uh, the end of the film, and I won't spoil it uh, for those who haven't seen yet. Um, 
I have to switch to the second example, which is Jan Komarsa's war documentary, War Surprising, that was edited entirely from archive materials, originally filmed as a newsreel by the Polish Home Army's amateur crew during the, um, the 63 days of Warsawian resistance against Nazi occupation. The surviving six in the last 70 years was lost, found, and re-edited several times. As a project hosted by Warsaw Uprising Museum, the original black and white material first had been restored and undergone a careful, historically authentic colorization and sonorization process in order to give back the colors of the period and the speech of the characters reconstructed by lip-reading specialists and finally dubbed by contemporary Polish actors. I will talk I'm not sure everybody's familiar with it. I would just like uh, to show a short clip. To, to jest Karol, mój starszy brat, filmowiec. W sierpniu 1944 roku kręcił kronikę powstania warszawskiego. Młody, podaj statyw. Trzymaj! A pani ładna nie chciałaby wystąpić w kronice powstania? W kronice? Nie wiem. Nie wiem. Jest pani radna? Karol! Może im trzeba pomóc? Pomagamy, tylko inaczej. A panowie, co tutaj robią? Kronikę powstania, oddział filmowy Rój. Jak to tak, rannych filmujecie? Nie, no akurat nie, ale wy i panie pielęgniarki, prawda, przede wszystkim zasługują, żeby się... Anymore. Uh, while uh, Son of Saw's fictional story was based on war documents, Kamasa's movie, built entirely from documentary footage, constructs a fictive plot based on a new script which dramatizes the events in a melodramatic tone, honoring the Polish insurgents for their fight and perseverance. The actions are accompanied by the comments, dialogues, and monologues of two almost totally invisible and fictive cameramen, Carol, and his brother Vitek. In the creation of the empathy mode of memory transmission, Kamasa's documentary imagines the cameraman as resonors. Their emotions, reactions, constant corporal presence is translated kinetically into unstable positions, shaking and falling camera movements. Um, the cameraman fictionalized agency has a strong interpretative power over the archive material and frames the historical resource with an envisioned tragic heroic narrative. The final movie, despite all the historical accuracy, raises very ambivalent feelings. The, mixtures of, uh, the mixture of authentic and fictive elements causes confusion and results, as uh, one of its critics, Polish media scholar Wieslaw Godzic, called it a meta film with documents dramatic elements. Real and invented filmmakers interact in variable dramaturgical structure with the on-screen actual insurgents, and the voiceover, the stint authentic, turns into authoritative and thus presents a desired revised supertruth. Added color and sound enhances the sense memory encoded in the source material, and the unusual intimacy of seeing and hearing people living 70 years ago in the middle of war has a strong empathy-provoking effect. But this sensual aspect is exploited in order to frame the events in a special way. Warsaw Uprising's memory war stands in this gesture of commemoration to remember as and to remember in a certain way, taking into account Komasa's same year national blockbuster feature film, Miasto 44, Warsaw 44, on the same topic. Warsaw Uprising seems to be targeted also to a wider international audience, including a post millennial video game 3D movie uh, generation. Um, and very shortly, we'll refer to the third one, which is Diana Gross' uh, first um, Regina. Um, the director first had as an initial visual source for the documentary these two almost identically looking full frontal studio photographs of Regina Jonas, the first properly ordained woman rabbi, who finally was allowed to hold services in the Nazi persecuted Berlin before being deported to Terezin and later dying in Auschwitz. Her unique achievements and heritage was collectively and totally forgotten for more than five decades when the personal documents, papers, and letters that she personally handed to the Jewish Community Center before her deportation were finally discovered. Grove worked with the help of Eliza Klopheck's uh, monographs on Regina Jonas, uh, but not finding any other survivors, she presents Regina's life by using the authentic written documents and compiled silent footage personally collected by her from German tech and Polish film and private family archives. I will again show just a show clip to have a, 
uh, mood samples. <laughs> Berlin, 1902. augusztus 3-a. Alulírott anyakönyvvezető előtt a mai napon megjelent a házassági anyakönyvi kivonat alapján azonosított Wolf Jonas izraelita vallású kereskedő, és bejelentette, hogy a vele egy háztartásban lakó házastársa Sara Jonas született Hess, 1902. augusztus 3-án délelőtt fél hat órakor Leány gyermeket hozott a világra aki a Regina nevet kapta. So, um, the Regina Jonas photograph reappears in the movie from time to time in various forms, cut out from the original photographs. Her figure shows up in the style of a photographic collage animation, magnified, inserted as a background or foreground, floating in the streets of Berlin. Grohl negotiates the absence of any other personal visual record with photographs, silent footages of Jewish people, girls and women living in Berlin, Warsaw and Krakow between the 20s and 40s. Following a different trajectory than Kamasa, Grohl does not attempt to hide its documentary's composite nature. Creating a zeitgeist atmosphere, she equally enriches the sense memory encoded in Regina's photographs and the collected archival footage. What we see finally are gestures, body postures, moods, clothes, hairstyles, hats, learning, reading, walking, young girls and women. But every word of the voiceover is a quotation from Jonas's documents or based on Klapek's monograph. Grow maintains a freedom and playfulness in slowing down and freezing footage, not in this way we have seen, panning, zooming in and mixing authentic and archive photographs and manages to melt the frames of Regina Jonas' identity and personal story into a general Jewish intellectual woman's fate. With added sound and voice, she builds a different authenticity. Uh, the photos and silent footages are, sur are uh, supplied with uh, uh, read, um, reading written testimonies of the witnesses, and these are read by professionals, uh, professional actors and amateurs too, including the filmmaker's own grandmother, uh, 86 years old Holocaust and concentration camp survivor. This is how Gross' documentary, as she declares, is not about Holocaust, it's about surviving. And to con conclude, I would like to um, summarize these um, three levels, three stages that um, these movies uh, perform this um, cinematic memory work. First of all, as um, media framing and quoting of the photographic filming documents, they offer an afterlife of these photographs and use them as memory anchors, cinematically integrate them, animate them, vocalize them, provide them with a sonic atmosphere. And in a second level, we can see in uh, all the three movies a phenomenological adaptation of the witness perspective and sense memory documented by the photographic gaze. The movies engage with the eyewitness as chronicler role, embodying their physical, psychic, and sensual point of view, endowing these, victim, these uh, witnesses with face, voice, and corporated presence to which the spectators as secondary witnesses can relate. And on the third level, the medieval phenomenological embodiment of trauma by the filmic texture and material itself, the way um, the loss, the absence, the damage, the shock is carried by the physical appearance, composition, structure of these movies. So, um, reaching the sense memory encapsulated in the silent archival image or footage uh, can work, I think, against the often declared desensitization process of losing empathy of Holocaust and Second World War trauma. That, were, that was uh, mentioned by Geoffrey Hartman, Susan Zontag, and Marianne Hirsch, with many others, uh, who uh, noticed the periodical loss of sympathy and points of saturation that thwart effective remembers as re remembrance as decontextualized and overused visual documents often work against commemoration, contributing rather to remembering to forget, as Barbie Salisur puts. Thank you for your yeah. presentation.
Our, uh, our first uh, speaker today is uh, Veronika Peche. Veronika studied uh, comparative uh, literature and film and holds a PhD in cultural history from the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College in London. In the academic year, um, uh, the, in the previous uh, academic year, she was a Max Weber uh, Fellow in the History and Civilization Department of the European University Institute in Florence. Since January 2017, she has also been a research uh, associate at the Institute for Contemporary History at the Czech Academy of Sciences, where she's a part of research team conducting a large clay oral history project about the student generation of 1989 in Czech Republic. Previously, she held fellowship at the Yale University in 2013 and the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna in 2015. Uh, Veronica, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for um, bearing with us uh, until now. This is the last paper of the conference. Um, I am going to talk about something a bit different to what we've been hearing so far in this panel because I will not be talking about trauma, but in fact about comedy. So I hope that this will be a nice kind of uh, light ending uh, to our conference, which has uh, revolved around very somber topics most of the time. Uh, and hopefully I will be able to um, entertain you a little bit as well with my presentation. So I'm going to talk about um, how uh, the period of state socialism has been represented on film in the Czech Republic after 1989. Uh, and like elsewhere in the former Eastern Bloc, of course, negotiating the public relationship to the socialist past was one of the pressing issues that the Czech Republic had to deal with after the end of the Cold War. And in this presentation, I want to draw attention to the role of popular culture uh, and in particular film and television representations in helping to manufacture an anti-communist interpretation of the socialist period in the Czech Republic, uh, which is a dynamic that played into anti-communism as one of the significant memory modes of legitimating democracy after 1989 in the public sphere. And so my contention is that uh, uh, many post-1989 representations of the socialist past um, already inscribe uh, liberal dem democratic values um, onto the characters um, uh, who, who are uh, represented as, as living uh, before 1989 uh, in order to make uh, the outcome of the so-called Velvet Revolution uh, appear inevitable. Um, so just to give you a short, uh, very short kind of uh, political uh, context. Um, I think that in the Czech Republic, like in many other uh, countries of the uh, former uh, Eastern Bloc, anti-communism became an important legitimating strategy for the new uh, political elites, uh, which needed to set themselves up against um, the former uh, regime. Um, but it also, of course, uh, became uh, a a very useful um, political tactic, an instrumental tactic of um, obscuring problems uh, associated with the uh, transfer to, to um, liberal democracy and a market economy uh, because the new political elites could, uh, by, by using the discourse of anti-communism, position themselves as genuine Democrats. Uh, I think this is a dynamic which in various variations we could observe um, after 1989 uh, across a number of uh, Eastern European countries. But of course, anti-communism uh, is not static, like any other narrative. It has undergone a number of transformations in the Czech Republic, and its salience has begun to decrease progressively um, after the end of the 1990s, especially as the um, right-wing governments uh, which were in power then uh, were hit by a number of crises and scandals, but also various other processes um, played into this uh, decrease of, of the importance of anti-communism in the public sphere, such as the diversification of the media or uh, also challenges uh, posed by, by historians. But I would like to point out one important feature which I think maybe separates uh, the Czech case from other cases, which is that anti-communism in the Czech Republic uh, was and is a discourse championed by the elites, the political and the cultural elites. 
the so-called winners of the transformation, uh, which I think is uh, different, uh, uh, for instance, to uh, Poland, where we can observe more of an anti-communism of, of the defeated, which is, expresses a kind of disillusionment with um, the, the continuation of, of uh, communist elites across the break of 1989. Um, but in the Czech Republic, this is um, somewhat different. Um, and what I would like to point out in this presentation is that cultural elites and filmmakers in particular often reproduced um, the kind of uh, uh, anti-communist discourse that was uh, so salient in the, in the public sphere. So I just want to show you some, some examples um, of this. Uh, um, I'll show you a couple of clips uh, and some, some images. And uh, my point is that um, this kind of implicit uh, anti-communist memory regime present in uh, these representations of socialism functioned also as a didactic tool of education towards uh, the values of, of liberal democracy and as a mechanism of uh, consolidating the perceived uh, inherent democratic identity of the Czech nation. Um, so and perhaps another specificity of the Czech context is that most of these representations um, uh, throughout the 1990s, but also the 2000s, took the form of comedy. Um, here's just a selection, but there are really many more uh, films and TV series. Uh, and these, these representations looked upon the past with a, a slight irony and a kind, benign gaze, laughing at the absurdities of the period and reveling in its aesthetics. And in this, they are perhaps uh, somewhat reminiscent of uh, the Czech, uh, sorry, the German trend known as Ostalgie, uh, or nostalgia for East Germany. So in, in Germany, writers and filmmakers have also adopted humor as one of their main nostalgia eliciting mechanisms. Uh, you might be familiar with the, with the hit film Goodbye Lenin uh, from 2003. But what I think differs in the Ostalgie discussions um, uh, from the Czech context is uh, that uh, in films like Goodbye Lenin, a kind of nostalgic longing for the utopian uh, promise of the socialist project is in evidence. For, ex for instance, the main character, uh, Alex, in Goodbye Lenin, um, admits at one point that when he rebuilds a kind of fake socialist universe in his flat as a charade for his ill mother, uh, he realizes that he has actually constructed a land he would have wished for. Now, that certainly does not happen uh, in the Czech case at all, where the Velvet Revolution is the implicit telos towards which the narrativization of the period strives. And for this sense of chronology to be present, um, nostalgia takes an unlikely object in the Czech case. Uh, that is, nostalgia for resistance against the regime and for bringing it down with small private gestures uh, in what I term petty heroism. So this is a longing for a time when there was a clearly defined enemy to fight against and when even a poor joke could be interpreted as a resistant act. The cultural precursor here is, of course, um, uh, the character Schweig from Jaroslav Hasek's um, famous World War I novel, um, The Good Soldier Schweig. Um, who, Schweig is a soldier who over-identifies with orders to such an extent that it makes his actions appear subversive, and this is a trope that we encounter in Czech culture over and over and over again. But we could also invoke George Orwell, who describes the mechanism of tiny revolutions in which a joke, in some way that is actually not offensive or frightening, upsets the established order. Characters in representations of socialism enact their own tiny revolutions every day in ways that temporarily upset the order, but never pose a sustained challenge. Um, and a typical example of this kind of gesture can be found in uh, the film, the hit comedy Pelishki or Cozy Dance by Jan Rzebeg. This is from 1999. It's, it was an extremely popular film in the Czech Republic. It was seen by over 1 million people in cinemas, which in a country of 10 million, you can imagine, is really quite a lot. Um, and in this film, one of the main characters walks out onto his balcony uh, and shouts a rather innocent anti-regime obscenity, which you can read up on the board, I'm not going to say it. Um, and then he retreats back uh, uh, into the apartment to his wife and he says, oh, I feel so much better now. Um, and so this, this, I would say, is kind of the summary of petty heroism. Um, so let's look uh, at a clip that captures this, this dynamic uh, in a somewhat more complex uh, and perhaps more self-reflexive way than this particular example. 
uh, in the film uh, Pupendo, all directed by the same director from 2003. Uh, the audience is asked to sympathize with the out of favor sculptor Mara, um, whose bohemian, somewhat precarious existence is looked upon with a nostalgia for the gray zone of semi-resistance against the regime. But in the clip, I'll just, uh, I'm just going to show you, um, he's uh, confronted by a more conformist acquaintance who would also like to be a bit of a hero. So let me just um, switch, or yes, if you could help me, please. Which one first? Uh, the Kalishki. No, this one, this one, Pupendo. Okay. It's good, you know, that you can't do it every time, like you, you know, from the unknown fatalier. I'm just different, I have to do it. Why do you think that if you're a man, you can't do it like you? You can't do it like a man. Someone comes there to do it, so that it's going to be changed by the land, but someone is going to be changed. You're talking about yourself, you're going to be changed by the land. No. Ty to děláš kvůli prachu. Ještě <laughs> mě budeš závidět peníze. Ne, vůbec, ani ředitelský plat, no. ani rudou knížku ti nezávidím. Ty no, mluví v biblických pojmech, vole. A lezeš jim do prdele, bolševiku. Aha, víš, no. protože nemůže být každý takový hrdina, jako seš ty. Paš, tak by si tvůj kluk už neškrt vůbec, víš. Co mluvíš pořád o klukovi, co no, jsi nás prošil, děcko? Ikve, nejkve a bude v pomocní škole, víš? A když si myslíš, že já to nějak žeru, nebo co? No. Já prostě jenom neříkám, co si myslím, no. A ty jsi tam říkáš pořád, co si myslíš, víš? No, no, že? No, no jistě, že? Já si můžu klidně říct, co si myslíš. No teďka tady, teďka ti to tady taky klidně řeknu, že? A mě nesmí, vole, nebo tě udáš školník a máš po škole. No, tak mi to řekni, vole, co mi teďka tady řekneš asi? Co? No co mi řekneš, předvěď mi to. No, vlastně, já ti řeknu klidně, co víš, co si myslím? No. Komunismus opil lidstva. Oh. Komunismus jste všichni hajzli, svině, zloději. No, to známe. A zrádci, se sovětským zrázem přišla být na zem. Jo, dobře. A teď ti něco řeknu já, jo? Tak poslouchej. Takže, je to jasný, jo? Takže, komunismus je svinstvo. Oživici jsou svině. Cože? Jak jsi mi nerozdělat, jo? Zopakuju klidně. Tak poslouchej. Komunismus je svinstvo. Oživici jsou svině. Aha. Já ti opravdu mílo nerozumím. Ne, tak já ti to napíšu, jestli chceš. No tak to napíš. Já ti to napíšu, pro mě to není problém. Já ti to tady klidně naškrábnu. Prosím. Takže. Komunismus je svinstvo a bolševici jsou svině. Napíš kromě míry břečky. No a to ti klidně podepíšu. Okay, uh, let me just go back to my PowerPoint. Uh, yep. Okay, so what we just saw there um, is a kind of othering or deferral of the enemy, right? So uh, for those who see themselves as uh, not implicated in the system, communists are always someone else. Uh, so here the character who is actually a member of the Communist Party uh, also externalizes uh, the communist because he is a better kind of communist, uh, exculpated by this insignificant uh, gesture of signing that uh, declaration. So in such films, humor functions in two ways. We laugh with the protagonists when they make a good joke and they ridicule the authorities, um, but often their acts of resistance fail or fall flat. And so then here we laugh at the protagonist. Uh, and the Czech representations of socialism are often organized in such a way that the characters who drive the narrative either resist the authorities with uh, specific gestures or they adopt a kind of generally apolitical uh, attitude towards the regime. Uh, the patterns of identification in these narratives rest on the assumption that the viewer shares an a priori negative stance towards the past regime uh, with the characters who drive the plot. So the impulse of this nostalgia for resistance is a kind of self-congratulatory mode in which the viewers, uh, together um, with the characters, revel in how well they manage to set themselves up um, against authority. Um, but at the same time, the failure of heroic gestures allows for a kind of exculpation because um, everyone engaged in some kind of form of everyday dissidence, all these characters have this kind of moment of petty heroism at some point. Um, so in this sense, um, these films uh, accommodate the relationship towards the past into the uh, values of the new liberal democratic order by recounting stories in which the mantle of dissidence uh, is in an egalitarian manner taken on by ordinary characters, so to say. Uh, and thus such representations of socialism reaffirm um, 
a, a politics where the present political order is seen as a culmination of a trajectory of Czech history from which one can turn back to exploit the aesthetics of socialism at will from a position of safety. And this only really changes in the late 2000s um, uh, when a kind of new wave of films um, reacting also, I think, to a kind of general change in institutional uh, memory politics, uh, especially the opening of the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in 2007, um, uh, which very much supported a kind of um, uh, discourse of, of heroism and finding genuine heroes and not just these kind of um, slightly um, silly uh, gestures. Uh, so, so, um, uh, it, so the, 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 this kind of the, the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes uh, sponsored a number of, of, of initiatives to kind of recover this uh, heroic memory and also a memory of trauma. Uh, and, and films start to react to that um, uh, in the late 2000s, uh, such as, for instance, uh, Agnieszka Holland's uh, Burning Bush. Uh, I mean, obviously, Agnieszka Holland is a Polish director, but she directed this, this film about 1968 in, in Czechoslovakia uh, for, for HBO. Um, but going back to comedies, uh, one of their main uh, attractions for viewers is their retro look which reproduces the fashions, hairstyles, makeup, and general material universe of the period it uh, portrays. Um, this is just an example from a popular TV series. The relationship towards the material culture of socialism while fetishizing the quirky and the outdated also participates in a generally superior, even condescending attitude towards the past. Um, and this mechanism is most memorably captured in, in Pelishki, the, the first film I mentioned, which generates humor uh, from the laughable inadequacy of socialist era products uh, in a couple of key scenes. And I'll just uh, show you one of them briefly. Thank you. So this takes place in uh, 1968. No, Euros Balto. Co? Co to je? Lžičky. No, lžičky. To se hodí. Lžiček. No pozor, to nejsou obyčejné lžičky, to jsou lžičky z umělé hmoty, lehké, ohebné, pružné, prosím pane profesore, to jsou lžičky, které vyvinuli výzkumníci z NDR, víte? Říkala, nechaj až na polárkové dort. To přece není do horkého kafe. OK. Um, just returning here. Um, yeah. That's just another scene from the same. Oh, sorry, is it? Ah, from the same film where something very similar uh, happens with unbreakable glasses from Poland. Um, so. The comedy of these episodes hinges on the one hand on the endearing deficiency of socialist era products and on the other hand the spectator is able to laugh at this precisely because in the present they know they are better off. Not only do they have access to better quality material goods but they also don't have to stand in long queues to procure them. Uh, now, at other times, filmmakers chose to comment on the past and the valuation of the present, not only by way of implication, uh, but by way of a more explicit education towards democratic values. And I'll just give you a brief example from this TV series, Viprave, or Tell Me a Story, uh, which ran on public television between 2009 and 2013 in five seasons and 106 episodes. 
And it tells the story of a typical Czechoslovak family from the 1960s to the present. Um, this family, in particular the main hero, Karel, so the guy who's kind of turning his head away on the right. Um, Karel, his father, um, and his grandmother uh, all preferred to stay out of active politics. And this is presented as a kind of model of living uh, through the socialist past in a comfortable yet uncompromising manner. Uh, Karel's friend Tonda, on the other hand, uh, who hovers on the edge of the dissident movement, is not portrayed as favorably. In fact, the two characters fall out at one point because Karel accuses Tonda of being an androš, which was a derogatory term for a member of the underground. So Vitrave's pedagogy is, is focused on the notion of the ordinary person rather than the exception of dissent. And many of the episodes stage kind of model um, model moral conflicts and their resolutions. For example, in one scene, one of the characters tells his colleague off for stealing uh, material from the workplace, which was kind of a very common stereotype associated with uh, uh, socialist enterprises. Um, so all of these characters are um, portrayed as sharing innate democratic sentiments uh, which structure their principles. Karel knows best, he's above politics, uh, communists are not to be trusted, never were, never will be. And while the idealist and activist dissident Tonda ends up in prison, Karel's obstinate ignorance of politics, even at the height of the Prague Spring in 1968, is portrayed as the most efficient strategy for survival in socialism. So when Tonda asks him uh, on a canoeing holiday in, 19, in the summer of 1968, what he thinks about the political situation, uh, Karel happily replies, we're completely cut off from the world here, we don't know anything. He waits patiently until the fourth season of the series, where the changes of 1989 retrospectively validate his view, and he finally sets up his own company in a newfound enterprising zeal. So a seemingly apolitical entrepreneur in waiting, Karel embodies the Czech national myth which harks back to the democratic market traditions of the interwar First Republic, suppressed by communist oppression, now making its comeback. The series' selection and reuse of certain elements of socialist popular culture becomes a mechanism of incorporating the socialist period into this larger narrative of continuity, which enables the narrativization of everyday life under socialism, suggesting that Czechs never endorsed communist ideology while existing within it. With their protagonists who scorn socialist politics, such representations help to perpetuate the myth of the Czechs as an inherently democratic nation. So by way of conclusion now, um, the topic of Socialism on the screen shows how the relationship towards the past expressed in popular culture can be used to associate values associated with the present. In the 1990s, many fil filmmakers attempted to tackle the new realities of the systemic transformation. Here's just a selection of films and TV series. Uh, they attempted to tackle these new realities without portraying the past, but by focusing on the present. And these sometimes rather awkward attempts at a critical film production uh, function less by way of example, the way the representations I have talked about did, but instead, instead serve as cautionary tales. As film scholar uh, Petra Dominkova remarks, film and TV, Czech film and TV of the 1990s worked with inherited expectations of the socialist era. Businessmen, kulaks, factory owners, in short, anyone who runs his own business, no matter what it is, is never a positive figure, she argues. So it thus took a long time before we get to this unequivocally positive image of entrepreneurship in the series Viprave uh, in the early 2010s. And we could say that this 20 year time gap uh, enables the makers of the TV series to retrospectively validate uh, the path taken by Czech society, uh, which contemporary filmmakers in the 1990s viewed more skeptically. A strategy of consolidation, which may have appeared all the more necessary to the series makers, as the reasons for partic particular contemporary political, social, uh, uh, political and social failures are increasingly being traced not so much to the memory of, of the socialist past, uh, but to the 1990s and the course of the market transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now uh, do we, I would like to uh, ask Magdalena Sariusz-Wolska to comment um, uh, all uh, previous talks. Magdalena Sariusz Wolska is an assistant professor at the Institute for Contemporary Culture at the University of Łódź and researcher at the German Historical Institute in Warsaw. 
She studied film studies, uh, culture studies and sociology in Łódź, uh, Gießen and Mainz. Her research focuses on cultural memories in Poland and Germany, historical films and visual history. Her current research is on reception patterns of, of historical films in post-war Germany and Poland. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, this is not a, an easy um, job to summarize the last panel, but I'll try to do my best. By the way, um, in Poland, we had unbreakable uh, glasses from Czechoslovakia. Um, I don't know if they were unbreakable, but that was well, they were told to be. So anyway, thank you for your very interesting and inspiring papers. And uh, actually, I find them uh, very coherent in a way. And I find this very panel uh, very, very coherent and uh, well composed. Because we have four papers uh, which uh, all focus on how certain events, both collective and individual, are represented in films. And all four authors, all, all four of you, uh, represent a comparative approach uh, in your papers. And so um, first I'd like to comment on each paper separately and afterwards I should share with you some general comments. And despite the order of the presentations, I would like to start with the presentation by Agnieszka Kiziewicz um, because it represents, um, it, it, well, it, the presentation itself is a little bit different than the others mainly because of a different geographical focus. Um, nevertheless, the processes uh, Agnieszka describes seem to me um, to be quite universal. Many examples of traumatized child protagonists can be found in European and North American cinema as well. Both children who had bad experiences at school. The most classic film about this is probably Jean Vigo's uh, Zero de Conduire from 1933. Uh, there exist many films about post-war orphans. Uh, we just should have a look in um, Konstantin Parvulescu's book about this. Uh, of course, films about children at, at war. Um, I can mention only Bernhard Wicki's West German film, The Bridge, from 1951, but there are many, many others. Also in uh, Polish cinema, as you, op as, as you know, so uh, the motive of kids, kids confronted with serious problems um, during the Second World War, or lost innocence, as you said, is something that is, I think, very present in, um, also in the Western cinematographies. Um, hence, I'd like to ask you to what extent are the Japanese experiences and their representations different, uh, especially from the European films. You mentioned the specific cultural context um, just at the beginning of your, of your presentation, but maybe you could um, elaborate a little bit more on this. And the second question is uh, whether the memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, so a memory which is absent um, in European cinema, play a role uh, for your traumatized protagonists. The other three presentations deal with European examples. I will start with uh, the readings of Regina was Rising or Uprising and Son of Saul, uh, which generally convince me, even though these are three entirely different examples of, as you said, handling of photographic documents in uh, memory objects. Especially when filmmakers reach the limits of representations, which happens in films about the war and the Holocaust, archival footage becomes useful. It can be included for different reasons. In your presentation, you've chosen examples which prove that archival films and photographs may provide, as you said, the witness perspective or the sense of memory. We could generalize this interpretation by saying that the role is to give a sense of authenticity to the viewer. Starting in the early post-war period, filmmakers often worked with original films and photographs. The best known title is probably Alain René's uh, documentary or um, essay film, Holocaust documentary, Night and Fog from 1955. Just a year later, 19, 1956, Andrzej Wajda used archival footage in his Warsaw Uprising film, The Sewer Canal. And again, uh, we could just add uh, many more examples. Uh, so coming to my question, 
Uh, how do you locate your examples within a longer tradition uh, of referring to archival footage in cinema? And to what extent are current strategies different from uh, historical examples that, um, uh, that were used? Uh, there is one point, however, in your paper I must disagree with. You justify the choice of your case studies by saying, and I quote, they, so the three films, were produced independently from each other, but the time and place of their stories finally interwine or interwine in Poland in the darkest shadow of Holocaust. However, Warsaw Uprising is not a film about the Holocaust, as you know. It is a film about the Polish uprising in 1944, at a time when the Warsaw Ghetto was already liquidated and the huge majority of the Warsaw Jews were murdered already. There is an ongoing discussion in Poland about the relation of the ethnic Poles who took part in the Warsaw Uprising to the very few Jews who survived the liquidation of the ghetto. Nevertheless, I find it problematic to talk about the Holocaust and the Warsaw Uprising at the same level. I would argue that visual documents of the Holocaust have a different historical and ethical status than the visual documents of the Warsaw Uprising. So uh, maybe you could um, comment on this, um, well, basically historical difference between um, the Warsaw Uprising and, uh, and, and the other, basically, Holocaust events uh, which are presented in the films. The paper about uh, films which depicts the Jasenovac concentration camp follows a comparative approach as well. While uh, Beja's presentation compared three contemporary cases, Anna Kriznis Lozica looks at the historical development of one motive. So you provide four uh, interpretations of documentary films which you treat as acts or performances of memory, as you said. At the same time, you contextualize them politically. Some of your uh, conclusions um, it's difficult because I can't see you here in that light. Um, anyway, some of your conclusions seem to be of universal nature, though. Similar patterns to those which you describe uh, can be found in Polish films about concentration camps again. Uh, while early post-war movies, for instance, the 1944 documentary Majdanek or Wajda Jakubowska's feature film Last Stage, introduce the victims as people, so as, as the early examples you mentioned. In later Polish films, the ethnical origin of the victims becomes more and more important. Hence, I would argue um, that at least from what I've heard in your presentations, uh, in your presentation, the films about the Jasenowatz camp represent some universal elements of the filmic memory of the camps, even though they refer to a very um, a special place. And finally, I'd like to comment shortly the paper about Czech films, which refer to communist history. Again, uh, many conclusions seem to be similar to the Polish social memory of communism or socialism. We had this discussion uh, an hour ago, I think, between the difference of the terms communism and socialism. Um, even though one important difference has to be mentioned, Polish narratives about the socialist past rarely use humor as a rhetorical strategy. So indeed, this seems to be something very typical um, of uh, the Czech uh, way of coming to terms uh, with the past. As post-communist post nostalgia was often discussed in recent years, um, especially when referring to Czechoslovakia and the GDR, uh, we heard yesterday a paper about Ostogi. Um, I wonder how you locate your analysis within the existing state of the art. And finally, some general remarks. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, all four papers deal with case studies and use a comparative approach. At the same time, they seem to prove general remembrance patterns which we know from other countries and cases. I appreciate very much the fact that all four papers refer to the idea of memory only at a very general level and focus on other categories, such as nostalgia, archive, ideology, or even trauma. These categories seem to be more useful in terms of analytical tools than the large concept of memory. However, the ideas of nostalgia, archive, or trauma are very broad as well and derive from many different theoretical concepts. Uh, quite obviously, for the, reasons, for the reason of the limited time of a conference presentation, the papers do not provide all information about the theoretical and methodological background of the research. Nevertheless, I'd like to ask 
you to elaborate more on the definitions and understandings of the crucial analytical co um, uh, categories of your papers, especially the category of trauma and the category of nostalgia and humor. Uh, what kind of understandings of trauma, nostalgia and humor um, uh, do you use and prefer and what, what theories uh, do you use? One of my favorite scholars who analyzed the past and the present was Reinhard Kozelek. He disliked the broad and abstract idea of collective memory, though he studied particular remembrance practices such as war monuments. He argued that research on memory should focus on three basic questions. What is remembered? How is it remembered? And who remembers? And all four papers give answers to the first two questions. So what is remembered and how is it remembered? But the third question, who remembers, is most difficult. It refers to the social actors who produce memories, both the makers and the receivers of the representations of the past. Anna Kriznitz, Lozica, and Veronika Peche commented on the institutions and, and the people who may have influenced the production uh, processes of the films. And I think this is also why this, this uh, panel has the fabric of memory in its title. But uh, films become a meaningful medium uh, or a meaning, meaningful medium of memory only when people watch them. Uh, I think Anna mentioned it also in her paper. Uh, so it is the moment of reception when the representation of the past becomes part of collective and cultural memory. Instead, the papers hardly commented on the viewers' reactions to the discussed films. Uh, and I would like to ask actually all of you if you if, if you have some information or if you can provide some information uh, about the viewers' reactions. So how, how did viewers, critics, uh, the public opinion deal uh, with uh, or dealt in the past uh, with these images? Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena, for your insightful uh, comment. And let uh, uh, all our panelists uh, respond. Um, maybe in the previous or order, so we start with Anna, then Agnieszka, Bea, and uh, Veronika. Um, thank you for the comments. Um, well, uh, first, when you said that, well, there is a universal memory that is visible from my, um, uh, from my analysis. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know much about the films that you mentioned in this Polish context, so, but this was a very valuable comment. Actually, I would like to know more about it. <laughs> um, and then, um, as for the theoretical and methodological framework, um, well, yes, um, I'm kind of really uh, try to focus um, in this paper more on the, um, let's say, reading of ideological layers. So this was the one moment, so, so the, uh, even the, the notion of trauma wasn't that maybe um, important in this aspect, since um, these films um, w were, um, well, the trauma, uh, the concept of trauma maybe would be more uh, useful in maybe different type of uh, types of research, but here, when, it's, uh, when we have really um, an issue, I don't know if I did emphasize it enough, but um, the memory of Yasenovac is very contested, um, and uh, it was really like problematic um, uh, point for the for the for the his, uh, from the historical and um, political point of view, um, and then um, maybe this um, issue of trauma here is just. Um, not in the first, uh, uh, like, uh, the, the, in, in the focus, um, let's say. But um, um, as for the methodology, I tried to, well, I, I've done a very basic, um, uh, on the one hand, it was the basic narratological analysis, uh, um, well, trying to identify uh, the positions, who is speaking and from what position and to whom and how it's referred to victims and to perpetrators. And of course also uh, here's this uh, visual analysis of, of how the, the, the relationship between texts uh, of the narrator and witnesses on the one hand and the visual materials. And um, well, I didn't uh, have time to go into it, but um, it's especially visible in this um, 
uh, well, fourth film that I didn't have enough time to elaborate on, um, but this is also uh, the usage of the archival uh, materials, um, original ones, um, that are really present in that film. Um, but they're actually used in a way, um, they use, uh, they had, uh, they're used as an evidence, although they're kind of, um, uh, their meaning is manipulated. So it's very, um, maybe um, also uh, the, one of the issues in which I would like that I had, uh, could go more. Um, so I, I made the emphasis in the theoretical approach on this um, idea of uh, memory act and performing memory. So, um, here it's really important uh, to do um, to see what the film does so uh, how what is the effect of the film so maybe this is something that really interests me but it is a tricky issue in the sense that when I'm, uh, when we deal with the films that are um, uh, like contemporary films like the, the last one um, it is not um, it's not difficult to find the reactions of viewers so this Later, uh, the latest film that was filmed in 2016, it was really um, covered in all the medias. Um, you can watch it on uh, YouTube and read the comments. Uh, so it's kind of very easy. And uh, the reactions were very divided, extremely divided. Um, but the problem is uh, when we have these uh, older films, I know that uh, all three of them were screened uh, at the Senovac Memorial Museum in their um, screening room. And they were screened to, uh, to the school children who visited and to, to other visitors. But I don't have mechanisms you know, to really know what was the reaction on that film. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so now me. So thank you for your comment, and I completely agree with your point of view and that the, and your comment that uh, there are many similar films on the Western ground, of course. And I also agree that I should underline uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing. Uh, I, sh I should underline uh, them more because this is this important. Maybe I didn't emphasize them uh, enough. But uh, you asked me uh, what is different. Uh, in Japanese films, so um, one point, of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because there is a complete annihilation of of the land of the of the um, part of the country. So, uh, of course, it's important. But another uh, fact, that, uh, another thing that is different from Western movies is that um, there is uh, in most films, and also in those films, uh, those post-war ut uh, children utopia. Uh, Utopia films, there is no antagonist that the children fight with or escape. Yeah, but they are uh, still on their own land and they escape memories, they escape history. But there, uh, mo in most films, there are no, uh, there is no enemy that is uh, chasing them or, or trying to do something. Uh, mostly, they escape the memories. So this is this is the the biggest difference, uh, I think. So, uh, and I, I think this this is enough. Uh, uh, of my comment in this case, because I, I still I could um, tell you more about this Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but I think here we talk about children, but memories, so there is no no big enemy here. So that's all. Thank you for your feedback. Uh, first, I would like to refer to the second one with the Holocaust. Um, maybe. Um, I don't want to suggest uh, um, misleading um, uh, facts. I mean, Holocaust and um, were surprising. Of course, um, I was amazed and surprised because um, of the three movies, which I uh, find uh, um, the possibility of grouping these three movies comes from the sense memory aspect. And I found a sur uh, surprising fact that um, everything is uh, very closely connected to 1944 and Auschwitz and Poland. So of course, it's a temporal simultaneity between them and Poland. 
is the place where the intuitive fit, but of course it should be corrected because uh, in worst surprising, this never um, referred to uh, anything uh, hol about Holocaust or Jewish, it's just the German enemy that is common in, in, uh, in the three movies. So thank you for this little detail, but important to correct it. Uh, and your other question uh, connected with archive, I think it's very, very um, exciting what is going on with the uh, using archive, with, with what we do we do with archive, uh, analog, photographic, filmic uh, archives? Of course, there is one um, reason because archives get uh, so important because we reach this end of witness era. So we don't have too many available witnesses. We need <laughs> we need other documents, and of course, this raises a lot of problems. How we um, how we uh, get close to them? How we attach to them? Uh, but I think that um, it, um, on the other hand, it generates a, seek, uh, a search for, for new uh, archival footage. And this is seen in the three movies, and I've seen uh, a lot of important uh, examples, for example, in Romanian cinema, documentaries, um, that actually present the, um, the successful research for photographic archives. For example, there is Radu, Jude's uh, Dead Nation, Tsara Marte, which is a um, 70 minutes long documentary made up entirely of photographs from the 40s, uh, private photographer. They just found an, an archive, um, uh, photography archives, and the whole story is built on this. Just We don't see anything else, just the photographs and, of course, um, um, it's um, with a voiceover of uh, a diary of a Jewish doctor from that period. And Wana Jurju's Aliyah Dada, again, is something that uh, presents uh, the the, um, the successful research of, of new materials. And actually, we, we, um, we see that it, uh, it can uh, uh, generate to find this uh, new um, materials that actually are there somewhere in the storage memory, but through these movies uh, gets, uh, as Alay Desmond calls this, in a living memory or a, or a functional memory that gets known for, for a wider public. Okay. Yeah, um, and thank you for, for your comments and, and questions. Uh, so just uh, briefly, how do I um, situate um, the Czech case or my research vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, existing nostalgia literature. Uh, of course, a lot has been written about Ostalgi. Um, uh, so this, uh, the, the, the example of, of Eastern Germany tends to be taken as a kind of paradigm uh, of post-socialist nostalgia in the region. And I personally don't think it's, it's particularly useful uh, for, for the Czech example or indeed for, for perhaps other uh, national examples because the German debate has um, ultimately focused so much on questions of, of German national identity or negotiating an East German versus a West German identity or uh, uh, as opposed to unified identity or vice versa. And uh, this this is not necessarily so productive when uh, translated to the, to the Czech context where, of course, identity does come up as I have tried to emphasize in my uh, presentation, there is this question of a kind of uh, democratic uh, identity, but but there isn't this kind of dilemma of a divided uh, country. Um, so uh, because of this, I have kind of tried to um, find other focal points uh, in this kind of Czech uh, nostalgia debate, one of which I think is this kind of uh, nostalgia uh, for resistance, which I think is um, is a very kind of prominent feature. Uh, and another prominent feature is something which I haven't had an opportunity to talk about so much in this presentation, but it's something that I call retro. And this perhaps will uh, answer your question a little bit about the kind of more uh, conceptual basis of the terms that I use, because I understand nostalgia as a kind of... Um, sentimental investment in the in a certain aspect of the past not not necessarily the the past as a whole but particular aspects um which uh in and in fact uh the, these these aspects don't even have to be particularly uh or the past doesn't have to be particularly positive right but it's more about taking this one kind of uh positive aspect such as the example of uh nostalgia for resistance which actually very much for it to function requires that um, the, the previous regime is understood as oppressive, dictatorial, and, and so on. Um, uh, but I think that uh, actually something that um, 
also comes up very strongly and which kind of hasn't been um, necessarily conceptualized also that strongly in the German case is this idea of retro or kind of um, memory of the past uh, divorced of this kind of sentimental investment, right? So this kind of purely aesthetic enjoyment where um, people uh, will watch uh, these uh, TV series or films kind of, you know, to, to see the hairstyles, to see the fashions and so on. But there, there isn't uh, necessarily some kind of longing to, for, for a return to the past or for a recuperation of kind of a, a lost, lost way of life. Because it's not that people necessarily want to wear those hairstyles, they just kind of, you know, enjoy looking at them. Um, and uh, so, so I think this is also kind of uh, an, an important aspect. Uh, and perhaps this also kind of goes to the viewer responses because uh, there are some studies about um, how, uh, for instance, this TV series I was talking about, Vipravi, or Tell Me a Story, uh, it was immensely popular. And um, uh, a, a few scholars from Charles University did a kind of focus group study um, about what it is that people actually like about it. And of course, um, what they like about it is not actually these didactic elements that I was kind of trying to uncover in the kind of structure of, of the narrative, but precisely uh, the kind of internet discussion forums or, or these focus groups revealed that people talk about, oh, those are the beer bottles that my grandfather had in his fridge, or you know, these are the cups that we had at home, or we also had this, this particular sofa and so on. So it's again this kind of aesthetic um, veneer which doesn't necessarily have um, a strong kind of um, uh, sentimental uh, attachment to, to kind of recuperation of, of the past. Thank you very much. So we have some time uh, for questions and comments uh, from the audience. Do we have any? Yes, Katja. So my question uh, is linked to the last, to, to your last comments, uh, the question of nostalgia, but also to the comment of uh, your commentary. Um, maybe it's not only the question who remembers, but also who is addressed with that. And probably it's not... Uh, it might be not so easy to, um, to get an idea uh, about that, but probably there are, we have different opportunities to analyze that. That means uh, to ask who is, a, is addressed within the film and to uh, try to, um, I'm sorry, I have a little bit <laughs> to, to concentrate, um, to bring out the different layers we have within the film. You said, okay, there's a re retro, but for, for instance, um, different things trigger different memories and different reactions uh, dependently from the person who is looking at that film. And then it might happen, for instance, uh, that an individual memory is confronted with a kind of interpretation. And then it might be, uh, to my opinion, a little bit more difficult um, concerning or to have an idea of the, uh, of the reaction of the film. You said these films uh, in Czechoslovakia are like a little bit like a bridge between the pre-war time and uh, uh, changes after after uh, 89, but what about the persons who were engaged in the system in the times of socialism, looking at that, uh, at that films, they then are confronted with something they have to deal with. Uh, there is an interpretation, they have an individual um, uh, memory of that all, and it can uh, provoke different effects. So what my question is, is uh, what are what are the, the means uh, and do you see um, different um, uh, layers of addressing somebody? For instance, um, are there um, are there citations of former Czech films, for instance? Then, so you see, for younger persons, it might be not, uh, they don't know that, and all the other things, so. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, these, these films, TV series, do address 
um, different groups uh, who do, I'm sure, respond in different ways, which also the, the study I mentioned, which actually tried to kind of empirically uh, see how viewers respond, does also to, to an extent show. Um, absolutely, kind of citing um, popular culture um, from the 1960s especially um, is, is a kind of very common strategy in, in many of these films, even to the extent that it's quite anachronistic that uh, films, for instance, that are set in the 1970s will still use kind of 1960s songs, for instance, because they're very popular to this day in the Czech Republic. Um, so yes, absolutely. These uh, these representations work on on many levels, which in kind of you know, if, if when there's more uh, space and time, it's also uh, very important to uncover that they address, of course, people with with empirical memories as well as people with kind of uh, who 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 don't remember the the past, right? And that's also where this kind of ironic mode of consumption w associated with retro uh, comes comes into play, right? Where um, a, a kind of younger generation can uh, look at look at these films and, and simultaneously enjoy, uh, but also laugh at uh, perhaps the kind of the deficiency that I was describing of, of some of these these uh, the material culture or even even the fashions which which may just uh, appear kind of funny uh, nowadays. Um, and then there's of course also this kind of didactic level of the of of the the filmmakers who who are uh, again also. They declare quite often in the media that they are attempting to address young people, right? That they kind of understand their mission not only as catering to um, an older generation who they want to please with kind of nice memories, um, but that they want to kind of uh, educate uh, young people towards uh, certain values. And, and this is this is quite often kind of uh, also a, a, a clear declaration made on the part of the filmmakers. I have a remark concerning uh, the Hungarian uh, perspective on sense memory and traumatic experience in East European post cinema. You've mentioned uh, in your text that those were amateur uh, filmmakers uh, who made uh, films from Warsaw Uprising. No, that's not the case. Those were highly professional film operators. Moreover, there were two figures, Jerzy Zarzycki and Antoni Bogdziewicz, who were very important for Polish filmmakers, filmmaking industry, both in the pre-war Poland. One of them was born in 1909. So he was not a young figure, but a very prominent figure already. But what, what's interesting, they were both crucial for rebuilding Polish filmmaking industry after the war. So it's a very professional account that unfortunately, from my perspective as a documentary filmmaker, was transformed by a younger generation uh, by adding this uh, commentary that's really not resulting from the spoken words. Yes, the commentary is just written by young screenwriters, yes, and was at least twice rewritten because it was not accepted by many filmmakers as being, you know, sort of very offhand uh, remarks added to the real historic testimony. Testimony done by soldiers because they were all soldiers of the, of the Warsaw Uprising, the filmmakers. They formed a special unit, fighting unit, that, whose duty was to make uh, the, the real account of the events. So it's a very different story from a um, non-professional camera filming here and there. It was trying to give a proper account of what was going on during these 63 days of uprising. Thank yeah. you. Actually, uh, I, was, uh, I was surprised to, uh, by this uh, term amateur too, because I've used uh, uh, War Surprising Museum's web page. They have a, a huge um, document and ma material uh, and press kit about it, and all the, <laughs> all the cameramen has, have their uh, kind of CV, what happened with them after the war, and some of them were even uh, um, just disappeared. So uh, I've seen that it, it was a very professional uh, project. At this time, so I've, I've quoted <laughs> the, uh, a sentence from the press with which used this word amateur, which was, I was surprised to because it seems that uh, uh, those cameramen working was were professionals. So 
it's something that has to be uh, corrected there, I think. Thank you for the for the. Thanks so much. I would like uh, also ask a question to Veronica. I like your paper very much, but also would like to hear a little bit about the larger context, and in this case about the uh, different modes of remembrance of uh, socialism in Czech Republic, and how actually, you know, <laughs> how this comedy genre uh, speaks to other modes of remembrance? Is it is it just an alternative? Is it a niche, or is it is it polemical with like law education and other other way the people do remember communists. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Um, as I said, comedy is kind of a, a specialty, I think, in this kind of post-socialist nostalgia uh, in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, I would say that uh, the status of comedy has, has a very high cultural legitimacy in the Czech Republic in general. Um, even if you think about, for instance, Czech films about the Second World War, they tend to be comedies, which I understand might be kind of hard to uh, comprehend for... Uh, other audiences, uh, but that is the case. Um, and uh, certainly in the in the 1990s, um, comedy was kind of one of the, it was the first genre really used also by, by um, writers, by novelists, to kind of somehow process the, the memory of, of socialism. One of the first uh, extremely popular novels was published in 1992 by uh, Michal Vivek, and um, literary critics at the time actually Mm, highlighted how this kind of comic humorous approach was in contrast to public discourse, which of course at the time in the early 90s was very much concerned with the condemnation of the of the previous regime, with uh, lustration, with uh, various other transitional justice measures. Uh, and so this kind of uh, cultural processing through humor was was kind of welcomed by by critics as 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 almost a kind of relief. Um, and uh, the reception of comedies has generally been um, very good uh, throughout the 90s uh, and into the, into the 2000s. And something really only begins to change in the mid-2000s when there's a kind of general shift in the kind of memory climate uh, in, in the Czech Republic, uh, where a number of NGO actors uh, step into um, into the kind of or intervene uh, into into memory processes there are a number of oral history projects that start running at, at this point which try to gather kind of the, the the memories of of resistance and memories of trauma so there is definitely a kind of sense in the Czech public sphere from the mid 2000s onwards that this also the, this genre of comedy has perhaps not um, honored the victims um, of, of the previous regime enough. Uh, so there, this kind of discrepancy uh, starts to form, and popular culture eventually reacts. Uh, I mentioned Agnieszka Holland's film, uh, but it's not the only one. There's a whole kind of wave of films and also literature which uh, tries to um, present uh, more heroic uh, stories, and uh, it, it certainly uh, uh, is very much connected also to a kind of institutional climate where these, these NGOs, as well as the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes, then use these new dramatic uh, representations as educational tools, for instance, in, in a number of, of educational projects. Um, and I would say that this kind of, this, this heyday of comedy is, is gone now. Um, so it really kind of was, let's say, the first 15, 20 years after 1989 when it was kind of the dominant genre, uh, but that's, that's changed since then. Um, I've got a question for uh, um, um, Agnieszka. Um, I was very interested in, uh, very interested in your uh, um, talk. Uh, it told me a lot about uh, Japan, uh, about which I actually don't know that much. Um, but I do know a bit about the history of youth, and uh, what uh, struck me is that uh, you used the concept of uh, childhood mainly, but also sometimes the uh, concept of adolescence. 
Um, now, I know that um, the phenomenon of adolescence was actually invented by the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century, and I wondered whether or not this concept also um, uh, made its way to Japan by that time. So was it a concept that you used, uh, or was it a contemporary concept? Uh, and uh, if the latter is the case, um, what is the difference, especially uh, between um, childhood and youth or adolescence, in terms of dealing with this trauma? Well, thank you for the question. And uh, this is very interesting because I think this, uh, I think, and I found it uh, in literature that this concept of adolescence it came uh, from uh, from West. Uh, but now uh, nowadays, um, especially after. Uh, 2000 there are so many movies about this concept and um, about uh, mainly about the school life so and uh, if I could add another part to my paper so it would be about uh, the trauma of school life because this this is I think uh, uh, on Japanese ground this is a, we could say this is a subgenre because uh, there are so many films about the teachers and uh, and trauma and, uh, uh, for example, suicide in the classroom. And um, also, I'm planning next next month probably. I'm starting, so I'm planning uh, to write a text about um, death in the classroom. So this is this concept I will uh, I research on now, and. Um, we could also divide this concept of adolescence to, for example, to bad um, to categories like bad children, bad teachers, uh, for example, bad environment, bad parents, and so so also we will have uh, a lot of other categories. So this is this this concept. And in this presentation, I used uh, suicide uh, suicide club to um, to show another concept that also appears and uh, and of course we didn't have time to show all, all the movies but if I could recommend you another movie so let's try Aoi Tori uh, so Aoi Tori is uh, a bluebird uh, the title bluebird after I think it was uh, made after 2000 so it is it is very interesting film about trauma uh, uh, at school and uh, and the invention how to how to deal with this trauma uh, um, and it is connected with adolescence so thank you So uh, we were uh, listening to a very interesting uh, talk, so let's uh, applaud all our uh, panelists warmly. <laughs>